नमस्कार भार्गव ग्लोबल नेटवर्क के कार्यक्रम में आपका स्वागत है आई एम भरत भार्गव फ्रॉम वॉशिंगटन एज सम ऑफ यू मे नो द इन्वोकेशन वी जस्ट हर्ड इज द ऑल पावरफुल महामृत्युंजय मंत्र कम्स फ्रॉम ऋग वेदा एंड इट सीक्स ब्लेसिंग फॉर आर हेल्थ एंड लॉन्ग लाइफ apropos to our topic today and also considering the current worldwide calamity chanting of this month is also said to remove negativity fear stress grief and illness and help gain courage and vitality so today we have three prominent doctors who will share some key ideas for prevention prediction and personalization of our healthcare in three critical areas heart disease diabetes and dementia the first two of which have been known to be more common among bhargavas allow me to give you a quick idea on the format of today's event the doctors will offer their opening remarks only for 10 minutes each uh, they have knowledge they could talk for 10 years or 10 days but today only 10 minutes that will be followed by questions and answers based on what you our participants have on your minds so please think about what you would like them to address and using the chat button please submit it keeping it brief and specific please do recognize that the doctor's answers will be for our viewers common interest and may not be considered as personalized consultation okay so after the q and a period we'll have our traditional two breakout sessions and a plenary session with no limit as we have been so grateful people have stayed for one two hours during plenary sessions and enjoyed each other's company and we look forward to the same today the, this these uh, breakout and plenary sessions will be great opportunity to share your own opinions and experiences with respect to the discussion that takes place before or discuss social matters as you see fit the doctors have graciously agreed to also be present during the breakout sessions so they'll probably pop up in any of the breakout sessions randomly uh, when they are uh, when they are changed also because the groups will be in small numbers whereas the overall attendees are a very large number before we start the main program please allow me to provide some other information bhargav global network affectionately called bgn has been fortunate to have gained participation by a large number of members of the greater bhargava parvar parivar from multiple countries today i'll tell you about one of those initiatives about the other two will do so in our future by monthly events this initiative the one i'm introducing to you today is called connect the word connect this is a whatsapp group that consists of members of bhargava parivar from around the globe given the high level of technical expertise in a wide range of important areas among bhargavas these bhargavas lot of bhargavas have volunt started volunteering under connect to help and guide other members desiring such help in an ever expanding range of areas such as health education finance and technology for starters and here is the logo of connect okay so if any of you wish to join or find out more about the group please send an email to connectbhargavas@gmail.com just like that connectbhargavas one word at gmail.com okay at this point i'd like to invite our able coordinator for the medical program to commence the event this gentleman is kamlesh bhargav a doctor himself he is a fellow of royal college of general physicians 
from London, UK, and is also trained at the Ox University of Oxford, a researcher, author, teacher, and trainer in medicine. Kamlesh, who lives in Canada, is also currently, currently mentoring and coaching physicians in India. Kamlesh ji, all yours. Namaskar. Uh, thank you very much, Bharat uh, Mama. And without further ado, I'll go into what you're waiting for. Um, so the first speaker is Dr. Rajesh Bhargav. We'll be talking about preventing dementia, how to not lose your mind, at least for the next one hour and then later on in life. So we'll give you the tips. So Dr. Rajesh started his career in medicine as an army doctor in India in 1980 and worked in Northeast India, Bhutan, Nepal, and the Middle East. After moving to the U United States, he helped set up one of the first hospitalist program in the country. He is actively involved with medical education and has published in peer reviewed journals and written textbook chapters. He has volunteered with Project Hope on several missions in South and Central America on USS Comfort and recently for disaster relief in Philippines, Haiti, and Bahamas. He has held a lifelong interest in wellness and lifestyle medicine and published several original papers relating to yoga, philosophy, and autonomic effects of pranayama in the 80s. Good morning or good evening, everyone. Thanks, Kamlesh, for the nice introduction. Uh, I would like to uh, thank all the people who are participating in uh, discussion about these common health problems affecting our community. First and foremost, I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to this talk. Uh, I would like to expound on three main ideas today. First, why we need a broad-based and holistic approach towards prevention. Secondly, share the effectiveness of a simple framework of four interventions which can significantly increase your uh, probability of avoiding many chronic conditions. And finally, I would like to talk about 10 specific interventions to lower your risk and delay the onset of dementia. So when you talk about health, most of us, we want to pursue a normal fulfilling life without any insurmountable obstruction from disease. And the secret of long life and healthy life lies mainly in finding a balance in uh, whatever, whether it's your blood pressure, your blood sugars, your body weight, as long as there is uh, stability, we experience good health and fitness. And anytime there is uh, psychophysiological instability, we feel at ease, which is the other terms for disease. You know. So how do we know this is true? So worldwide, when you look at, um, in 1999, Dan uh, Butner from Minnesota, he, along with a team of scientists from National Geographic Society, they went to places in the world where people live up to 100 years of age without any disease or disability. And they found these people had certain commonalities in their lifestyle. And if you look on the right side of the screen, there is... Uh, the right side of the screen, there is uh, this Venn diagram which is showing um, they had some common features in terms of uh, not uh, smoking, they ate a base diet, they moved every day, and they had very strong social and family networks. And four years back, I had the privilege of visiting one of these uh, villages in Okinawa, Japan. And this is a 104 year old lady, Junko. She rides a bike to a farm three miles away. And every day she uh, works in a farm for three hours, growing sweet potatoes and other things. She comes back, cooks a lunch. And uh, on the right side, you see the screen. This is the meal that she cooked for us that day. And it's all stuff that is grown in a kitchen garden, except for a small piece of fish. It's all plant-based diet. And then afternoon, she takes a short nap and visits all her friends and family in a village. And basically, um, after that, she has a light lunch and sleeps for eight hours every day. So you might say that, is it feasible? Is it practical for everybody? So I'll give you another example in Elmida County in the middle of Silicon Valley. 
So they looked at a cohort of 7,000 people over a period of 25 years and looked for their healthy lifestyle habits and um, looked at how, many, how often these people were following these things, is adequate sleep, physical activity, not smoking, uh, eating meals at regular time, not snacking, and maintaining ideal body weight. And when they looked at these people at the age of 45, you know, depending on the number of these healthy habits, you could predict how long they will live. So each additional habit or lifestyle intervention added or subtracted 11 years to the life expectancy. And our own, um, in our own culture, you know, Shushruta Samhita states that regularity of habits is the secret for um, avoiding illness. So the next point I wanted to stress on was, can we have a simplified platform or lifestyle changes to ensure optimal health, including brain health? And these are what I would call the four pillars of health meditation uh, practice to avoid stress, exercising, mainly aerobic exercise for up to 30 minutes per day, a plant-based diet, and sleeping seven to eight hours uh, every day. And right now, there are about 100 wellness programs and studies all over the world where just these combination, these four simple factors have shown that people can ensure longevity and avoid chronic illness up to 78%. And you can see, depending on the number of these interventions that someone practices, you can have up to 78% uh, overall re reduction in chronic diseases. So clearly there is uh, something going on, you know, which is beyond medications mm -hmm. and other things that we do in healthcare. So coming to the main topic today, dementia, uh, you know, any time, um, when uh, most of us who are a little older in age, we forget somebody's name or forget where we put the keys or park the car, we start panicking. Is it the beginning of the end? Are we developing dementia? Which is not true because a lot of it is these things are due to lack of paying attention. When we did that, these episodic memory lapses do not mean that you're having dementia. So there is a spectrum from normal to dementia. And uh, early on, you know, when you do this testing, you know, you can usually identify some of these people. And nowadays with imaging studies and advanced biomarkers, you can pick up these things even before people have symptoms. And a lot of us have these common um, mem temporary memory lapses and a lot of it is related to age, but then there are other things like medications, depressions, infections, hormonal problems, or nutritional deficiencies. And a lot of these can be treated effectively. That's not the end. Dementia, on the other hand, is a very definite uh, mix of neurodegenerative conditions and of which Alzheimer's disease accounts for 60 to 80% of these. And these are usually caused by accumulation of certain toxic chemicals in the brain between the synapses and neurons, which causes destruction and inflammation. So over a period of time, you not only use your memory, but also other areas of cognition, like your judgment, your reasoning, and your executive functions, they are all impaired to the point that the person is not able to carry out his daily activities and often will need institutionalization. And this is the biggest challenge of a generation. And I noticed that not many of us are affected, but many of us are worried about it, mainly because worldwide, the number of people with dementia is exploding as the population is living longer. And this is clearly a disease of old age. And it is estimated that in 30 years, the population of people living with dementia will triple. And the reason why this is important is it's, it's an expensive disease. It's probably the most expensive disease. United States, last year, we spent about $800 billion on direct and indirect costs related to dementia. And in India, you know, this is again, uh, not uh, that big of a problem compared to it's only about a third as prevalent there, but, you know, with uh, low and medium income uh, countries, you know, the impact, the financial and economic impact of this disease is going to be astronomical in, in coming years. So a lot of interesting things that have happened in the last four or five years in terms of biomarkers, early diagnosis, 
And there are about 150 clinical trials underway right now on finding new cures for this illness. But so far, you know, we have a couple of anticholinergic agents which are which have very minimal effect on dementia. So in the meantime, what can we do about it? And again, you know, this is a devastating illness, not just for the person, but also for the entire family. Uh, so these are the 10 things that can be done to mitigate the risk. The first two, as you can see, the aging and choosing a parent is not something that we can do. So uh, as you can see, the age has a direct relationship as, as you are, uh, as you grow older. I think I'm hearing some disturbance. Maybe someone can mute their mic. So um, as you go from at 65, you have one in 10 risk and at 85, one in two risk of having dementia. Genetic factors, you know, there are three major genes that have been identified which cause autosomal dominant uh, dementia, but fortunately this accounts for only 2% of cases. Majority of us uh, do not have this problem. Uh, but, you know, if we have one parent with dementia, our risk goes up by one and a half fold. M not maintaining ideal weight, again, is a risk factor which can control. Uh, there's a saying that if you, you should eat your uh, food like medicine, otherwise you will be eating your medicines like food. And a plant-based diet, which is rich in these elements, green veggies, healthy animal fat like fresh protein, berries, caffeine, and omega-3 fatty acids and one. All these things have been shown to be, have a beneficial effect on the brain health. And there's now several studies on Mediterranean diet which, and its positive impact on cognition and brain function. This is just one of those studies. As you can see, there's a huge impact of changing your modifying your diet. In terms of a Bhargava diet, you know, we are lucky that we have a lot of haldi or turmeric in our diet, which is a strong anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effect. But, you know, many of us are vegan and uh, it's important that we check and replace B12 vitamins, which are only available through the animal um, sources. The other thing which is very common among our community is hypertension. And um, so a lot of us are being take treatment, but then only 20% people are generally under good control. And as you can see from this study published last year, that uh, it doubles your risk of having vascular dementia yeah, if your blood pressure is not under tight control. So this is really important that you not only take your medicine, but also make sure that you have a good control. Sleep, again, this, or lack of it rather, many of us who are overweight have uh, sleep problems. And uh, this study clearly shows that uh, not getting adequate amount of restful sleep is a huge risk factor for dementia. And most of the preventative maintenance of brain removal of all these toxic chemicals and also organization of long-term memory takes place during deep sleep. And if you are cutting short on your sleep hours, it's going to affect your memory and risk for dementia in the long term. And the other part is about head trauma. You know, if you ride a bike, make sure you wear a helmet or wear a seatbelt when you're driving. Uh, most of this damage occurs in people who have repetitive brain injuries like football players and boxers, uh, where the risk of Alzheimer's is almost fivefold. So this is something to keep in mind. The other important thing I wanted to stress is uh, as you get older, you know, if you're not learning something new every day, uh, you're going to lose a lot of your brain reserve. Uh, an average person has 100 million synapses in their brain. And when you learn a new language or if you uh, learn some new activities, learning, to, um, uh, learning how to use your iPhone, for instance, any of these things uh, will increase the amount of uh, connections in your brain. And when you have damage, then your messages can take a detour that way. It is so and wonderful. Rajesh, how, are we, how are we doing with time, Kamleji and Dr. Rajesh? One um, minute more. I think I'm almost close to ending. Uh, give me another minute. Of course, of course. So, so, so good. So the inflammation, again, is shown to decrease the brain size, affect the areas which deal with memory and 
meditation practice can easily reduce some of this uh, exercise, especially aerobic exercise, one of the most powerful uh, things that we can do to preserve a brain uh, function. And uh, it decreases the level of brain amyloid and uh, definitely can be go a long ways in uh, helping preserve our brain health. So out of these 10 things that I mentioned, you know, most of these are within a control and it's not all doom and gloom. And when you look at this program from University of uh, California and uh, LA, they have Alzheimer's prevention program and they were able to show that you can delay the onset of uh, dementia by four years by practicing these things. So mm. I think prevention clearly helps. And I think it's important that we write, no matter where we are, we start uh, incorporating these things in a practice. Uh, so at, at, with that, I will end my presentation and I look forward to your questions during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajesh. It was a wonderful talk. And uh, yes, I am worried about uh, dementia and would like to do all these seven things which you have mentioned, adequate sleep, activity, maintaining recommended weight, uh, not smoking, uh, moderate alcohol, eating breakfast daily, uh, though I'm on uh, what you call it, intermittent fasting. Yeah. And eating meals regularly. And yes, Arunamami asked about bridge. Good. Uh, that would be a good exercise to keep yourself healthy. So with that, Thank you very much, Dr. Rajesh. And before we move on to uh, the next speaker, people can put in their questions in the chat box directed to me, Kamlesh Bhargav, uh, and uh, then we will answer it after the three speakers have done it. And over to the next speaker. The next speaker is Dr. Rakesh Bhargav. Uh, Dr. Rakesh is based in Canada. He's a director of Heart Care Cardiac Research Prevention and Rehab Program in Cardiac Wellness Center, Oshawa, and a senior staff cardiologist in Lake Ridge, Lake Ridge Health, Oshawa, Canada. He's the, principal, he's the principal investigator of numerous phase three and four landmark clinical trials in collaboration with McMaster University, Montreal Heart, Heart Institute, Harvard Medical School, Duke University, Cleveland Clinic, and the list goes on and on and on. I will spare you the details. He was the recipient of the annual award for outstanding innovation in patient care presented by the Research Institute in honor of the auxiliary of Lake Ridge Health, Oshawa in 2004. So over to you, Dr. Rakesh. Well, thank you, Kamlesh. For those who do not know Kamlesh, my brother. Kamlesh, you gave a very nice introduction. He just introduced me to our mother as well. She'll be very happy to hear what you said. <laughs> so, and I'm honored to be invited to speak to this uh, global Bhargav Intelligentsia on Zoom. I've given a lot of talks, but, oh, before I forget, I should turn my timer on because very important. I've, I've done that. I'll remind you one minute before. Okay, thank you. Um, so the topic that has been given to me is heart disease prevention, protection, and personalized care. So usually the speaker will give his summary at the end of his talk, but I'm different. I want to be different. I'm going to give you the summary and conclusions right in the beginning because I believe that, and I fear that if you have the Bhargav sleep gene, you will have dozed off in the next 10 minutes. So my objective is to keep you awake for the next 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Actually, I did not know the question and answer will be later, but I'll hope to keep you awake in 10 minutes. So the messages are, number one, yes, if you are born a Bhargava, then the gun, a loaded gun is pointed at your heart. Secondly, yes, you can prevent premature heart disease by lifestyle changes and timely treatment. Thirdly, yes, you can find out if you are developing coronary artery disease before you suffer a heart attack. Yes, you also can find out, uh, well, just, yes, you can also live a better life, a fuller life after a heart attack if you make the lifestyle changes and follow the recommended treatment 
And actually, a lot of my patients tell me if they had the heart attack or bypass surgery before and made the lifestyle changes, they would have been much better off. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I want to say, do not despair and treat yourself as a disabled, destitute because you had heart problems in the past. I think with the current day, with the way we are, you can lead a full life even after heart attack and bypass surgery. So that's the positive message. I hope you, so that's the conclusion and my uh, the summary of what I'm going to tell you. So, so heart disease is not a hidden threat. We are born with a loaded gun pointed at our heart and it's the environmental factors and lifestyle that pulls the trigger. And we can talk about the heart disease. And let me just tell you, the heart disease can affect the coronary arteries, can the heart muscle. Um, just one second here. Um, so the, I made it, okay, there we go. So the heart disease that we're gonna to talk to today is about the problem with the coronary arteries, the plumbing system, which is this year. And we're not gonna talk about heart failure, which is due to a weak heart pump or the electrical system of the heart, which can lead to palpitations, very slow heartbeat, which may lead to a permanent pacemaker. So we are going to focus on coronary artery disease, which is these coronary arteries, which get blocked up. We call them rusty pipes. And this leads to angina and heart attack. And I believe the Bhargav Global Zoomers, there are only two reasons you are here today. Either you already had heart problems or you're worried and fear that you may have heart disease. So the question is prediction. Yes, we can predict heart disease. One way is very simple. You go and go to the local pundit and look after your horoscope and he will tell you when you're going to have a problem and uh, they will, they'll fix it for you. But if you come to me, since I do not know, I will tell you, how do you find out that you have heart disease? There are only four ways. One, you develop symptoms. Or we do some diagnostic tests but done by a doctor. Or you have a heart attack and get an angiogram and stents. And of course, the one way you find out the heart disease, which you do not want to find out, is a massive sudden heart attack and sudden death. So the first three ways are preferable. How do you find the heart disease? Your symptoms, the tests, and of course, angina and heart attack. What we tell about the Bhargavs, because we're born with the wrong gene, both for diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, everything, and we intermarry amongst ourselves, we should start check up young and find which trajectory you are on because we can change and delay or prevent the heart disease till you die just of natural causes. So, so often question is, doctor, I'm worried about my heart. Can you please do some tests? And how do we answer your question? The most important thing is the medical history. The doctor has to hear your story and the story has to be heard from the patient, not from the father, mother, or the mother-in-law. Physical examination, then of course we do blood tests and electrocardiogram and TMT, the stress test. And there are of, of course more advanced tests like the coronary angiogram, CT angiogram, that is reserved for a different stage of your heart disease. How do we prevent? As already has been mentioned earlier, we need to control high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, avoid a sedentary lifestyle and uh, avoid unhealthy diet. Diet is actually very crucial. And if you are a smoker, which we are very happy to hear and see that uh, very few smoke uh, in this audience here, which is wonderful. So you just have to look at yourself. If you have the spot belly and you may have thin arms and thin legs, you have this central or abdominal obesity, that itself is a risk factor. And we need to do something to get your um, weight down. So prevention, very simple, lower your blood pressure, improve your cholesterol levels, lose weight, control the blood sugar, and of course, uh, smoking. As somebody has already mentioned before, and it's well known, if you are a pure vegetarian, or at least have 70% uh, 
your diet is plant-based diet, you have a 20% lower risk of dying over the next 12 years. If you eat meat and you cannot avoid it, you eat meat as a condiment. That is, the meat on your plate should be the size of a pack of cards. And I wanted to bring the card, but I forgot to bring it. I have a picture of, so this is a pack of cards. Limit sweets. I love sweets and I'll tell you what I do about my sweet tooth um, in the breakout sessions. Don't fear all fat and give eggs a go. Eggs have got a bad reputation, but you can have eggs even if you have a high cholesterol and heart disease. And we'll talk about it in the um, breakout sessions. Very important to know that only 20% of cholesterol that floats in your blood comes from a diet. So while you work on the diet, sometimes it, or 80% times, times it is the liver that makes too much cholesterol and you need to take medication. And of course, as Indians, especially those who come to North America or rest of the world, our Indian diet combined with the Western diet, that's the problem. So, so the last thing that I have to talk about is how to get personalized care from a physician. I think if you have heart trouble, see your cardiologist at least once a year. And most important, very important, avoid the opinion from non-cardiologist doctors in your family and friends. Almost every one of you, my guess is, at least you have six doctors in your extended family. And they may not all be doctors. They could be professors of pathology or anatomy who never look after heart patients and they will give you the advice. So I think it's not you who is the problem going to them. It is them who give you the advice or something that they don't look after. You should do, uh, you should know your medications. When you go to the doctor, make sure you have a list of medications. One minute more. And you write down, thank you. And write down your questions or ask on every, well, what you have to ask. Go with a family member. And cardiac rehab is absolutely essential if you have heart trouble. And if you do not have a cardiac rehab program in your, okay. So I've got a few more seconds. When you go to the doctor, brown bag your medications, take it to him, let him look at it. It is very important for your cardiologist or your doctor he should try to de-prescribe some medication. It is so easy for us to write a prescription and send you out of the door. De-prescribing is more challenging because we have to explain why we are uh, stopping one of the medication. You should always ask, doctor, do I really need to take all these medication? Only very few drugs are for life. And I think that's all I have to say. Uh, I came with this idea, which I did not make a slide, we should make a toolbox for you. For example, the emergency information form, which we can talk about. I give it to all my patients. Fill this form. It tells the emergency information about your medication, your headlines of your, heart, uh, of your medical history. Stick it on your fridge. When the paramedics come to your house, everybody's in a panic. You just say, on the fridge. Everybody knows where the fridge is. So thank you for listening. Uh, I'm ready for the question and answer period. Okay, right. So, thank you very much, uh, doctor. And uh, I'm sure your mother and my mother will be proud that you finished in 10 minutes. And uh, going over to uh, the, my key take home slide was when we all Bhargavs are born, our parents take uh, the date, time, place of birth, etc., and get a Janampatri made. And then they say, okay, this is, this is going to happen. And they might say at 50 years of age or 60 years of age, you will have a heart attack. And you are 65 and you have not had it. Now is the question. Okay, so that's one. Don't believe in this astrology stuff. See a doctor. The other key point is, uh, was very important is when you're going to your doctor, talking to your doctor, take all your medications. I'll repeat that because, and, the third one is de-prescribing. The length of the prescription, I was taught in medical school, the length of the pre prescription shows the ignorance of the doctor. I end my case there. And once again, thank you, Dr. Rakesh, and we'll move on to the next speaker. And before we do that, questions in the chat box, please. 
I'm sure you all have a lot of questions and we'll try to do justice to most of them. So the last speaker is Dr. Anuj Bhargo, uh, who's going to talk about diabetes prevention, prediction, and personalization in care. And a brief introduction of Dr. Anuj is, since 1994, has strived to improve the health and lives of people affected by diabetes through clinical care, education, research, and technology. He received his fellowship in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism at the University of Wisconsin in 2002, obtained a physician executive MBA from the University of Tennessee in 2006 and became a certified diabetes educator in 2007. Dr. Anuj is the CEO and medical director of Iowa Diabetes Research, first diabetes research center in central Iowa, USA. He's also the founder of My Diabetes Home, a personalized tool designed to simplify diabetes self-management for patients and revolutionize office visits and clinical care. So over to you, Dr. Anuj. Well, thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. And it's so exciting to be here uh, to see so many of Bhargava's join. Uh, thank you to the uh, moderators for arranging this, putting in the heart and soul in making such a successful program. So uh, just about myself, 1994, final year of med school in Delhi. That's when diabetes fell in my lap. That's the thing I got very passionate about as I was studying several things. Why not colon cancer and why not uh, eye disease or blindness? It goes back to many mamas and mossies having diabetes and my most favorite one dying from diabetes and heart attack. So that's the story. Uh, I'll talk about prevention, prediction and personalization. Um, so diabetes is common it means uh, this is 463 million people with diabetes in 2019. Even in the group today, we had about 40% people with diabetes. So that's, that's quite an eye-opener. And this is not going to get better for a long time. Our future generations will see this. 700 million people by 2045. One in six adults with diabetes in the world comes from India. India exports a lot of diabetes. The problem is one in two people with diabetes remain undiagnosed in India. So think about it. 40% of people here in this room have diabetes. If that was true, there's another 40% might have diabetes. I don't think that's the case for this eclectic group, but something to think about. A lot of people in India remain undiagnosed. One study in New York City, all adults studied, uh, Indian adults studied in the study, half of them had either diabetes or the precursor disease called prediabetes. And lastly, by clicks would work, Bhargava community may have even a higher prevalence of diabetes simply because of how we marry each other and so forth. Um, and one more slide um, to grab your attention because I really call diabetes the destroyer and the killer. It's the number one, uh, seven leading cause of death in the US, leading cause of new cases of blindness, leading cause of people getting on dialysis, leading cause of non-traumatic amputations. And lastly, we give a lot of business to Rakesh ji. I mean, a lot of people with diabetes will die of heart attacks and stroke. Uh, Rakesh ji, you can send me the, my uh, bill later on. So scary disease, absolutely scary disease, but that's not the point today. That's for grab attention. And now let's talk about the three Ps that I was charged with. First of all, prediction. So how do you predict what's your risk for diabetes? Um, well, if you're a Bhargava, I think you should just skip this step and go to uh, getting the next step. But otherwise you can go to one of these sites um, and it's pretty easy. I ran this, the first one is American Diabetes Association. And the second one is from UK um, and fairly easy uh, to do this. You can go in and you don't have to make a username and password. You can pretty easily do it. And I would let you uh, try that and find your risk for diabetes. Now, uh, the next step of uh, uh, prediction, right? Screening, how often should you be screened? This is from the American Diabetes Association, but I have simplified it. Uh, for Bhargavas and Southeast Asians. So at least every three years, if your BMI is more than 23, body mass index, which is a relationship between your weight and height. And I'll there are too many tools out there. I'll show you one tool that I made recently uh, or 10 years ago. So if BMI is 23 and one of these risk factors, first degree relative, you have heart disease, 
high blood pressure, uh, trouble with your good cholesterol, if you're not active or if you are above age 45. So uh, bottom line is, if you can't remember this, that's fine. If you're an adult, just every three years, get your blood test done. What are the blood tests we do? Um, by the way, before that, so this is one of the platforms I made called My Diabetes Home, and you can easily calculate and track your body mass index here by putting in your weight and height, and then you can see the graphs and curves as well. Okay, so now for diagnosing diabetes, what do you do? Well, in the good old days, we used to do other things like uh, give a glucose tolerance test. Now, just one finger stick can do it, either fasting. And if you're not fasting, even then it doesn't matter because now we can use A1C, hemoglobin A1C, which is the percentage of your hemoglobin that has glucose attached to it. So this is the most common thing we do now. Normal is less than 5.7. Diabetes is 6.5 or above. And prediabetes, which is the precursor, 5.7 to 6.4. You can also get a sugar drawn and then uh, above 126 is called diabetes. So that's the way to do it. Just make a commitment right on your calendar that you will get. If you don't have diabetes already, get the, one of these tests done with your doctor. All right, next, prevention. I think this is cool. So can I prevent diabetes? Um, there was a study done in US, Diabetes Prevention Program. They had three arms, placebo, metformin, and then 7% weight loss slash maintenance. Uh, physical activity, 150 minutes a week, just like brisk walking and so forth. So here's a poll for you guys. Um, uh, 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 chime in on your chat. You can uh, say which one was more effective. What do you think? A medication called metformin, which is used for all patients with diabetes or 7% weight loss. Kamleji, are we seeing some uh, comments in the chat box? Can you read what's coming? If not, I will carry on. Um, and here's what happened. Metformin was 31% and lifestyle, 58%. 58% risk reduction. So the answer is clear. It's lifestyle. And enough has been uh, said earlier already about lifestyle. And we can talk more about this later on. 150 minutes a week is not uh, much. 30 minutes, five uh, days a week. India Diabetes Prevention Program shows uh, results more attenuated, but about 28% risk reduction with metformin or lifestyle or both. The last topic, 40% of you have diabetes. What's your goal A1C? What, should, what is your goal weight? What medications should be on? It's all very personalized, personalized and hyper-personalized. The, all the key pillars of diabetes management, nutrition, activity, sugars, and medications, all of them uh, need to be personalized. And I don't have the time to go in detail about what this means, but really it should, at the end of the day, it's what works for you. Any lifestyle changes that you make should be pleasant and healthy so that they can last a lifetime. If you don't like Mediterranean diet, don't do it. It's probably my most favorite diet after that. Um, but if it doesn't work for you, so be it. Find what's good for you. And that's the personalization I talked about. Um, this is one example of hemoglobin A1C. What should your A1C be? Well, the answer is it depends. And it depends on a lot of factors. So if you have a high risk of low sugars, I'm going to shoot for a lower for a less stringent control. If you had diabetes, you were newly diagnosed, I'm going to be very strict in getting you to an A1C of 6.5. Long-standing diabetes, I'm not going to be. Um, if you have important complications, then I'm going to be less stringent. Um, if you are more motivated, I'm going to be more aggressive with your diabetes control. Bottom line is we individualize. In general, I say if you're young, and I'm not going to say what age that is, if you don't have heart disease, and if you're not taking medicine that cause low sugar reactions, your A1C goal should be 6.5, otherwise seven. And sometimes I shoot for seven and a half or eight. The next big blockbuster, and I've done research on, I don't know how many meds, 150, 200 diabetes trials, a lot of different things I do. 
But I don't think medications is the next big blockbuster in changing diabetes. If you want to really improve the health and lives of people affected by diabetes, technology is going to take the game. So I'm just telling you, as you think about everything, add technology and apps as one more thing in your uh, fight against diabetes. So we have built something 10 years ago. Um, we're very focused on patients, but also provider friendly. And I just want to talk about the fact that it's very personalized. As you think of technology, meds, everything else, think, uh, think about personalization. One of the things I wanted to do is um, something from Rakesh, the cardiovascular disease risk prediction. In my patients with diabetes, I'm actually doing two things. One, I'm trying to get their sugar in control, so A1C. The second thing I'm doing is I'm trying to prevent them from dying from heart attacks and strokes. It's very near and dear to me. As I told you, my mama died many years ago, uh, 84, with uh, diabetes and heart attack, right? So um, I built this tool uh, based on the data, and this is available to you guys, where you can easily uh, calculate your cardiovascular disease risk. I would urge you to do this as well. Dr. Ahmed, one minute more. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I knew you were coming with that accommodation. So here we go. All right, here's the summary. So, uh, and again, I'm looking forward to Q&A. The prevalence of diabetes, diagnosed and undiagnosed, is very high in uh, Indians, Southeast Asians, and Bargavas. So make a commitment today. Just write it on your calendar. Get my sugar or A1C checked. There are many tools to predict uh, risk of diabetes. Go take one of them. And I can put those in the chat box later on, those tools. Screening strongly recommended every three years for most adults, unless you're just risk-free, but most of us probably aren't risk-free. Diabetes prevention is possible, 58% risk reduction with lifestyle changes and 7% weight loss. So if you are 70 kilograms, five kilogram weight loss, that's what we're talking about. And then personalization of care is necessary, apart from the tools we have talked about, think of technology platforms. Lastly, I just want to say one thing, uh, this platform that I made 10 years ago, um, and it's a labor of love and passion. Um, I'll make it available for Bargavas where they can calculate their body mass index, weight, blood pressure track, calculate the 10 year risk, uh, track your sugars, meds. There's a really cool tool called Visit Optimizer. You can track all your meds there as well as uh, write the questions for your doctor with it. So a lot of things there that you can do at mydiabeteshome.com. And that I think covers everything. Thank you so much for your attention today. One key message was personalize, personalize, personalize. You are not one of a million. So remember when you are asking questions or anything, it is personalization. That's the key point which I have taken. And the other one is, thank you very much, Dr. Anuj, for offering us this facility, the service. Yes, technology is important. So with that, Again, thank you and a big clap for all the speakers. Over to you, Bharat Mama, then I can go into the question oh, answers. Sure. And, and so, Kamalajji, you, you can see you have received a few questions, obviously. You have? Yes. yes right. Yes. Okay. So, I have to both apologize and explain something to our participants. We wanted to do a medical event because, of course, many important things we have tried to cover, but medical was important because that's that's connected with our life. But uh, we, we identified these three areas as being very important. Uh, and yet we could not do one independent event for each of them because that might be too much. We hold our events once every two months. So we took the chance in making one event with all these three that was very ambitious. But I feel from listening to the doctors that we have accomplished that goal very well with the, the pills of wisdom that and knowledge and advice that they have given, that alone has been worthwhile already. And now we wanna have Q and A's because that will, that will give answers to additional things or queries or confusion that people may have.